how would you actually stop true female power? Like you teach them to hate themselves. You teach them to be obsessed with the fact that like my vulva looks weird, it smells weird, right? There's something wrong with me. I have to be perfect in order to deserve an orgasm or pleasure and nobody's perfect so I'll never deserve the kind of sex that this body craves. And the reason why that's so effective at silencing our voices and our power is because sexuality is a core power, it's arrows. Welcome to the Deja Vu podcast, where we believe that living a life of magic can be the default. Join us each week as we playfully and authentically dive into the mysteries of life and explore what it truly means to be human. From spirituality, wellness, and all things taboo, we don't hold anything back. So without further ado, let's let the magic unfold. Hello, you beautiful humans, and welcome back to another episode of the Deja Vu podcast. I'm really juiced up and jazzed up about today's episode for many reasons, and you'll, and you'll under, uh, like unravel and uncover those reasons throughout the episode as you continue. If you don't know this human, as you get to know this human, if you already know this human, then you just get to know her a little bit more. Uh, but I can personally say that this woman has been a massive force in my life in so many ways. I got to hear about her just through the grapevine and so many people were saying to me, Blue, you need to know Layla. You need to know this woman. I feel like y'all are going to be friends. I feel like you're going to collaborate. I feel like you have codes for each other. And it just kept popping up left, right and center. And it was a matter of just a matter of time before we actually got to meet. And then it just so happened to be that we didn't just meet, but I casually moved into a house <laughs> you know we go from zero to a hundred real quick sweetheart. you know what I mean <laughs> and so I, not only did I get to understand the massive impact of the wake of this woman and what she has liberated within the hearts of hundreds of thousands of people around the world uh, I personally have experienced the activation and the liberation that this woman has brought into my life I have gone from being shut down a little bit around my sensuality and only allowing it to be channeled towards my my sacred union and my partnership to actually recognizing that there is eros all around us and the full liberation of a woman is a permission slip for every aspect of myself that is not in full liberation so Layla Martin has been the walking embodiment of a liberated woman and not only has she done this for herself but she does it for everybody that is around her and I have receive the utmost blessing to share a temple home and space with her and be able to weave with her in the in-between moments from the crunchy to the ecstatic and everything in between from moments of us just standing in the kitchen making our morning drink and ecstatically dancing while wearing towels on our heads <laughs> to dressing up in our costume closet to flinging ourselves around a pole and liberating ourselves in our sexy underwear to all of the also super unsexy moments where we find ourselves in side-splitting laughter and complete <laughs> adoration for the expansion of what sisterhood can truly bring into our lives. So this woman is nothing sh short of a tsunami of power. And I can totally first-handedly say that she has changed my life for the better in so many ways. It is truly, truly, truly an honor to finally introduce Layla Martin to the Deja Vu podcast. Yay! I am so excited that we are finally doing this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and we've lived together for almost a year now. I know. And we actually, people don't even know that we live together. <laughs> which is like, sad bitch. <laughs> However, also bad bitch. Totally. It kind of makes are. it real. Like we weren't doing it for like the Instagram <laughs> likes, you know? Like we were actually just living together because we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's It's been... Nothing short of um, insanely powerful to be in the presence of a woman that has decided to go against the grain of what society has expected from us and to liberate yourself beyond shame, beyond guilt that doesn't just sit in our lifetime, but got passed on from mom and grandma and the matriarchal line and the patriarchal line and every direction from society as being in a female vessel and having that sensuality and that sexuality. And yet simultaneously, it's the most threatening piece to society when a woman is fully liberated and expressed. And so 
for those that don't know you and don't uh, know a little bit about your journey, I would love to just go on an arc of understanding like who Leila Martin is and how did you get to this place of such an ecstatic, liberated bliss that is now pulsing through the hearts and minds of so many people that have had the blessing to be able to be in your parameter into your experience. So that there's got to be a time where you weren't fully liberated and and actually were on the receiving end of the suppression and then made that like segue into uh, an illuminated path. So would you be would you be so kind to take us on a journey, darling? <laughs> oh, darling, sure. <laughs> and I'm still not fully liberated. Yeah. Many, many more doors to unlock here. <laughs> <laughs> It's part of the seduction of the goddess is the forgetting and the remembering. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> And from the moment you walked into the door here, I was like fully in love with you on all levels, like a soul, like just like, fuck, yes. Yeah. So it's been such a blessing to have you in my life. Such a blessing. Mm. You opened up your world to me. Like I was going through a really tough time and uh, going through a separation and didn't have a home. And sisterhood is really, really important to me. And not only did you welcome me in, but you made me feel so seen and cherished and you bent over backwards to make it happen. Like it was, it was really such a beautiful embrace from a woman that didn't really actually know me, but no, like felt me and felt my heart. So it's such a gift to be able to, you know, just say thank you in real time on the podcast for others to be able to witness that you're a huge part of <laughs> my fluorescence of my own inner being. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, so, so my journey. Um, Yeah, I was born in Colorado, and I think some things that help people kind of understand my unique conditioning around sexuality, like what shaped my experience of sex and the body and being a woman, is number one, my family was Catholic, and I was very devoted to Catholicism and to the idea of not having sex before marriage, and really internalized a lot of that purity consciousness and, you know, not being slutty and not having sex before marriage, which was both a Catholic church and very important to my mom as well, bless her, um, mm-hmm. because she really felt that that was a very important part of having a great life was, you know, getting married and having sex just in the context of marriage. And uh, I was also um, sexually abused by my biological father starting when I was very young um, until seven years old was the last time that I saw him. So also some of just the deepest, like heart wrenching, um, like I want to say soul destroying, but not permanently, like a temporary soul destruction in that connection to myself. Mm. So much so that when I was nine, I would uh, bathe in a bathing suit because like my own body was so disgusting to me and I couldn't bear to look at it. And I would mm. shave off my hairs when they started growing in because I hated any indication of womanhood. Um, I used to pray every day on my knees that I would never get my period and that God would never turn me into a woman because I think I associated womanhood with sexuality and now sexuality not only meant bad and wrong and, you know, deceptive is what I want to say and dangerous, Mm -hmm. um, but also sexuality was the space where I had already been so hurt. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, as we know sometimes, like sometimes having that depth of shadow is where then we find some of the greatest wisdom or teachings, right? Because it wasn't just like, behold, I am woman. You know, the times I've like longed for like some like French upbringing of like sensuality and embrace the body or whatever. And so I'm like obsessively shaving off every <laughs> like not in a good kind of like, let me feel sexy way, but right. no, like, ah! oh, like <laughs> pop the brake. <laughs> what is happening when I started getting breasts? I was like, no, 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 no. You oh know, like it was so intense, just, just rejection of, of my womanhood. And, and just very, very hard. And even my first like real true boyfriend who, who loved me and had devotion for me. Um, like the first time I saw his penis, I went into a full freeze, like a full trauma freeze. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. He didn't know what to do. He was just a teenager too. So he just dropped me off Mm -hmm. and I just sat in the snow shaking. And, you know, now we have Oh, the blessing of understanding trauma in the body so much more deeply. Mm -hmm. These amazing teachers and leaders and research in the field of how to integrate trauma. Back then, like it was so little discussed 
I don't know if people remember this, but Oprah was actually one of the first people who said like childhood sexual abuse is wrong and it's really damaging and it really messes with people. But that's actually a fairly recent part of our social consciousness and even that you can heal trauma and even that it's important to heal trauma. So we've come so far as a society. And then I had like nothing, no, no guideposts. I didn't know what was happening to my body. I was just so terrified and so afraid. And I would get such uncomfortable feelings during sex. Um, I would just shut down. I was in so much pain. Mm. So it was very, 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 very challenging. And, and I, I share that because I think whatever anyone's going through, right, like a lot of my work is actually taking us from like, okay, to ecstatic and fabulous, right? <laughs> like, even if you haven't experienced trauma, like even if you haven't been through hell, there's still so much more that all of us can experience in our body, that all of us can experience in terms of ecstasy and magic and orgasm and sacred sexuality. And a lot of you watching will be like, but if I had an abusive relationship or I had an abusive childhood or I've been numb or I haven't had sex in 10 years, like, can I still do it? And my answer is absolutely, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the, like, we started there. So, um, so I went through all of that. And, um, and when I went to university, I had this deep desire to change um, sex education in high school. So I went to Stanford University and I was really specializing in sexuality. And I was just like, I'm learning so much, honestly, about like STDs and immunology and like at what age, like women tend to, you know, have sex for the first time and get pregnant. And I was like, I want to know how to fuck. Like, <laughs> I was like, not only that, but like, there is some stuff in here and I want to integrate it. Mm -hmm. And so I got a one-way ticket to Thailand and went to Asia and I was, uh, I had moved to India. I was traveling through India. And I just remember the first time I saw the word Kundalini and it like leapt off the page and it was like this, like this is what you're doing. And I had a full body reaction and it was the same thing with Tantra. I was like, whatever that is, like that's, this is what I'm doing with my life. And it was really a spiritual path for me. First and foremost, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted the truth. Like I can't even say I wanted enlightenment. I just wanted to know the truth more than anything else. And it felt like my path to the truth. And I loved, I loved so much. There was this teaching. I, uh, one of the first books I read on Tantra was the, from the uh, Gori book set from Robert Svoboda, his teacher of Amalananda. And you know, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like, what makes a left-handed Tantrika is that you go where it's hardest to love God and you find devotion there. And I was like, yeah. Ooh. Like a lot of people Ooh. spend their time going where it's easiest to love God, where there's like beautiful music uh -huh. and it's sublime and it's like sacred, mm. you know, sacred in the way we would think. And I was like, I want to go where it's the hardest to find God. Mm. And I want to love her there. And that was my path to devotion. And so I started to follow Tantra and, and studied in Asia for mostly 10 years, a little bit on and off, and really dedicated myself to the spiritual path. And then through that, found a lot of the neo-tantric teachings, which are much more about sexuality specifically. Mm -hmm. And part of that is that spiritual Tantra is one of the only paths, right? It comes from India and then it spread and, and really developed in Tibet and many places throughout Asia. It's one of the only intact spiritual traditions that celebrates life as a path to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And so while it's not sex specific, sex can be a path to enlightenment. Relationship can be a path to enlightenment. Making money can be a path to enlightenment. And so this all encompassing embrace of life as part of the spiritual path really spoke to my soul. And then lots of the neo-tantric teachers, really starting with Osho in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, taught very specific sexual practices to liberate and activate our sexuality because so many of us carry so much shame, so much repression, so much shutdown there. Mm. And one of the things that I learned was we tend to think of our sexuality as an expression of our partner or like ourselves, like I'm either broken or I'm this sexual woman or I'm a slut or mm. I'm, a, I'm frigid. Like we have all these identities around sexuality. And one of the things that I saw so clearly is sex is not an expression of your partner or your partnership or you, like who you think you are. It's your nervous system and how your nervous system has been programmed and what your nervous system feels is safe. So 
if you can't surrender or feel that much pleasure or orgasm, it's because your body's saying, I don't feel safe to do so. And of course we don't feel safe in a world that's been violent and misogynistic and challenging for sexuality for so, so, so long. And one of the things I really saw was on one hand, we have all this unaddressed trauma, which can come from very specific experiences like mine. We also have a huge amount of social trauma around sexuality as well, mm -hmm. of slut shaming. And even, you know, men have been so lied to around how they have to perform and show off and give a woman a million orgasms to be a real man. You know, like they're so much just messaging mm -hmm. that we get that disconnects us from mm -hmm. our core sexual power. And something that I realized in myself was I was like, wait, like if you want to silence women or all people really regardless of gender, but really it came to me as women, I was like, sure, you can like burn them at the stake, great. Right? Like you can like kill witches, but like it's so intensive, it's so messy. I was like, how would you actually stop true female power like you treat, like you teach them to hate themselves. You teach them to be obsessed with the fact that like my vulva looks weird. It smells weird, right? There's something wrong with me. I have to be perfect in order to deserve an orgasm or pleasure and nobody's perfect. So I'll never deserve the kind of sex that this body craves. And the reason why that's so effective at silencing our voices and our power is because sexuality is a core power. It's eros. Mm -hmm. And you can have that power, yes, to share in divine union and divine partnership, but that power also surges through our womb space and reminds us of our oracle nature. It surges through our hearts and opens our hearts to love in ways that are bigger and bolder than we ever thought possible. You can use your sexual power to go straight through your third eye and activate visionary capacity beyond anything you've ever known. And so as I was learning that, I was like, wow, like sexual repression, sexual shame, it's one of the big biggest lies we've ever been told, but it sits in our body and it silences us in ways that are not only killing us, but harming the planet, harming families, harming children, harming society. And it's crazy because you can't go into the bedroom and just shut it off. You go into the bedroom and you're still like afraid of your own asshole. You can't even tap into your womb power. You can't unlock your own voice. So these social codes, they control us even in the deepest of our intimate private moments. And so my life's work became like, how, how do you unlock that for people? How do I unlock it for myself first and foremost? So I ain't going into a freeze response every time I see a cock. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we should be totally okay. And, and like, maybe, maybe we could. Yeah. <laughs> there must be something beyond this. <laughs> <laughs> so like I'm gonna do the work for all of you and like also also I want to give head like a champion you know oh. so like <laughs> <laughs> and then I came home from Asia and I launched this and moved in with you and it's been <laughs> fucking amazing ever since <laughs> and now here we are <laughs> not without challenges but still yeah. amazing <laughs> you are the epitome of turning our greatest challenge into our greatest gift. And that is something that I continue to reiterate with the teachings of the Gene Key Tower. With every shadow, there is also a gift and a superpower. And just hearing more of your story and understanding the arc, of course, there are so many details that are placed in between those like main pointers. However, this gives us a really good understanding of like under really recognizing the passion that lies in the core of your belly that allows this work to land in such a deep way because the pendulum has swung so far into the darkness and the self-loathing and the fear and the confusion and the distortion and the maya that has crushed it on you from such a young age. And then from the core of that wound, you have actually stayed curious. And that curiosity has created a bridge for you to not only activate this within your own being, but activate this within hundreds of thousands of people around the planet, which when you were speaking, like I'm like getting teary because of my genuine deep appreciation with the courage of what you've done with such a painful experience mm -hmm. and how you have alchemized that and turned that into gold and how that has your journey that you've gone on has directly changed my life. Mm -hmm and made me more of myself. And I didn't realize how shut down I was until I met you mm. and how, until I moved into this house of realizing that being in the presence of somebody that has unlocked something within themselves 
will highlight and put a flashlight on where I am not. Yeah. And that is ultimately the greatest medicine that we can bring. And it's also triggering as fuck. <laughs> For most people, yeah. right? Like it's like, oh, oh like I'm <laughs> totally not got my attention, intention, awareness set into that space. And there's this like, part of me that lives in there. And like when I actually peek into it, it's like there's this like tiny golem that's in there that's like, <laughs> <laughs> my precious, don't come here. <laughs> <laughs> and what you have allowed me to do is open the door, see my little golem who's like, hideous, and <laughs> from my perspective. Um, and, and you have gone, you can love, you can love that too. Yeah. Because I'm here living this expression without shame, without guilt, and allowing the innocence to be born from the inside of my era. And because of that, when I open the door now, I don't actually think that that is hideous. Mm -hmm. I actually want to make friends with that golem. And once I actually start loving the golem, it's almost like the, the, the tale of the, the, the princess and the frog. When she actually kissed the frog, kissed the golem, it transforms magically actually into one of the greatest gifts and offerings. And so it's really like my gratitude for your path and who you are mm -hmm. and how you show up is so deep and so much reverence. And, and <clears throat> I recognize how much work there is to be done. And also at the same time, how much fun there is to have while doing the work at the same time. And that's something that you deeply embody. Um, I wanted to say something really quick just on the, the gremlin, because I think that's a very common experience for people. Like they start to go deeper into their sexuality and they find some version of the gremlin, some version of shame or disgust or fear or numbness that scares them. Mm -hmm. And that's why it can be challenging for people to, to start the sexual journey. Um, and one of the things that became so clear to me is like in the Buddhist and many of the Hindu traditions, the, the, the demons are protectors of the temple. And when I first learned that, I was like, oh, like yeah, that makes sense. Oil. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. well, yeah, even even in the <laughs> Christian church, you'll see that, right? In the Catholic church, like the gargoyles outside of the, the great, like, Catholic cathedrals um, is that uh, in Notre Dame. But um, <clears throat> I got that at first. I was like, oh, yeah, like, who do you want protecting the temple? Like a cherub, you know? <laughs> like, right. like, let that thing play in the garden, you know? <laughs> the cute little booty. No, you want a you want a gargoyle, you want a gremlin, yeah, yeah, you want a yeah. demon, like, right? <sighs> but then when I really got it, like it like it all clicked, I was like, oh, like everything that feels shadowy in many ways developed as a protection of that which is sacred. Mm -hmm. All of our protectors, like which feel very scary, are protecting something sacred. So your gremlin learned very early on that it wasn't safe to be fully sexually mm -hmm. expressed or fully in your arrows. And so you kept a gremlin or developed a gremlin there guarding the gates of your temple. Mm. And one of the great spiritual processes, right, is to realize that like we're basically all just defending ourselves against such an immense blessing and so much beauty and such an indescribably infinite gift mm. that like we're basically barricading and protecting our goodness in a reality where we forgot how to be like the fullness of all the amazingness that is. Mm -hmm. And so these layers of protectors, which are very deep in many people's sexuality, they can feel so scary and intense, and yet they're always there to try and protect us. If you feel shame, you won't go somewhere. So if you don't feel safe to have an orgasm or you don't feel safe to be in your full sexual expression, you'll have shame instead of your orgasm. But once you learn to make friends with the shame, I call it like eating shame for breakfast. Like you get so comfortable. Like you're, so, you're like, so you want to like make out with the gremlin or like sleep with it or whatever. <laughs> or like you could like, you're so comfortable with shame. You're like, yeah, I could eat it for breakfast. You know, then you get access <laughs> to this incredible sexuality, this incredible arrows mm. within you. So for people that are listening that are going, okay, I for sure have a gremlin. Um, <laughs> totally. Maybe a couple of them. Maybe they're all hanging out and they're plotting, you know, how they can bring their family members also to the gremlin party. We uh, should do a compare your gremlin like yeah. story thing on Instagram where it's like submit a Canva yeah. expression of your gremlin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's your gremlin called? What does your gremlin like to eat? You know, 
Um, I think also just even the sense of just like giving it a little character, it also returns the innocence to the gremlin. Um, <clears throat> so for those that are listening, I'm like, okay, we've detected that I have a gremlin, um, which would probably be most people that are, are listening to this. If you're human and you have been exposed to any societal expectation or conditioning at all, which is most likely 100% of humans, then there's going to be something crunchy here. Once that's been detected, what are the action steps that you would say that somebody at home that could even just through a curiosity, right? There's, there's a detection of the gremlin and then they, there must be a curiosity to actually want to go deeper into it. Once those two pieces have been detected in someone's psyche of going, okay, I see there's, there's a gremlin, there's something that's holding me that was created from my childhood, which has created a protector, somebody that's protecting my temple. And I have a curiosity to actually liberate myself. What would you say or guide people into being able to liberate themselves from this? Totally. So I will give you some like accessible techniques that you can use. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've seen over time is sacred sexuality and this tantric journey, right? It's, it's like medicine work. It's, it's ceremonial. It's deep. It's profound. And it's also <laughs> like trying to teach someone yoga you know, through like a couple of tools or techniques, mm -hmm. like it's a whole system. It's an elaborate system designed to hold you through a profound process so you can overcome these pieces mm -hmm. and reclaim some lost part of yourself and return to wholeness, right? And so that whole thing is a journey. And so um, in describing it, it's like, it's, it's yes, there are things you can start doing right away and it is a deep and profound methodology. So if anyone feels super called, Right. That's where you start deep diving and really doing the training or really doing the study, mm -hmm. because that's what actually really catalyzes the evolution inside. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of different pieces, though, that you can start with at home. The first is to start to practice everything that comes up for you around sexuality as being an invitation to love, just like you found with the gremlin, because we find there's so much program self-judgment and criticism and like make wrong of ourselves around our sexuality. Like I'm sure anyone listening could easily come up with five things that they make themselves wrong for in their sexuality. Um, you know, I don't orgasm fast enough or I'm in my head too much. I don't want sex enough. I want sex too much. Right. Like all these things, like I don't feel enough pleasure. I feel too much pleasure. Right. We all have some version of this. And so the invitation is to actually start to love those parts, those those things that we judge and to start to really normalize our body as doing the most intelligent thing that it knew and learned how to do given our sexual experiences, especially when we were growing up. And so our body is expressing intelligence through our sexuality. And if we want to shift or change it, we have to start by acknowledging the body's wisdom and intelligence rather than trying to fight it. And so most of us are in this like fighting spiral with ourselves rather than this like, what would it look like to love myself, right? Which is so, so, so important, especially in sex. The other thing that I really recommend is starting to develop a pleasure practice. It can be anywhere from five to 20 minutes. You can do it, you know, as often as you want, but even just once a week. And what it is, is an opportunity to touch your body, to access pleasure, to self-pleasure if you want, and to have it be an open space of exploration. Mm -hmm. Because most of us either masturbate, kind of usually like how we learn to as teenagers, right? We have our grab bag of like favorite cherished fantasies, right? And like mine used to be like, oh, I'm a secretary and my boss wants to like take me over the desk or whatever. Like, <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> There's like no shame in that. I used to be like, how could I have such a patriarchal fantasy? And I was like, who cares, honestly? Like, <laughs> And your fantasies do change when you do sexual work. Like they do, like, you know, you can evolve your fantasies. And also it's like, whatever. Um, and so... <laughs> So oftentimes we're just masturbating and we're doing the same thing that we always did, you know, like I like would have my legs crossed and I touch my clitoris with circles or whatever. And I'd fantasize about the same thing, which is great. Like, it's not <laughs> like you have to stop doing that, but think of it as like Doritos or fast food for your sexuality, right? It's not like you can never have it or like, you know, something like we might like French fries or whatever. I don't know. Um, and so it's like, it's not like you never want to do it or it's so bad, but you, what you want to do is be filling your sexual experience with something deeply nourishing. 
And so that's where a pleasure practice starts to shift that. It's almost like giving yourself some sexual kale or some uh, like a sexual blueberry smoothie or whatever. And so when you start to touch yourself that way, it's like no agenda. I'm not trying to get to a climax. I could, but like I'm not pushing myself there. I'm going to take a break from my usual fantasies, my usual toys, all of that, not because there's anything inherently wrong for, with them, but to give myself space to really hear what's going on, to really connect with myself. And then in that, you can do some deeper breath work, but even just touching yourself with a lot of consciousness, paying attention to what comes up and loving yourself in that space, like that starts to shift your nervous system in a really profound way. Mm. Step one, make out with your gremlins. Yeah. Step two, exactly. <laughs> shower with, with your, your gremlin. gremlin. <laughs> the gremlin Step three, groom your gremlin. Groom the gremlin. <laughs> Give the gremlin a nice little like head massage, you know? It's Comb totally. her hair. Like a couple of hairs that it's got. Yeah, <laughs> like a lot of hair, yeah, yeah, probably, because yeah. it's a gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of weird comb over. <laughs> <laughs> Let yourself get bitten by your gremlin. <laughs> <laughs> I might paint my gremlin. Fuck it. I might like paint my gremlin. Like just make a giant painting of the gremlin and be like, "Hey, we love you." Gremlin king. Gremlin king. I would love to dive into the journey around how the parallel path of you expressing yourself more, going into the gremlin, love making out with the gremlin, bringing the gremlin alive, and. And yet how this has triggered the people around you, right? Like I find that regardless across the board, whether somebody starts to find their voice and start sharing their spiritual journey or whether you're the first person on the dance floor and you're making crazy dance moves, already that's triggering mm -hmm. for those that are not fully expressed. But mm -hmm. then specifically around a topic around sensuality and sexuality, because this one is so loaded. Like there are so many sedimental layers of rock that are like boom over thousands of years that have been compiled in the memory of our DNA, which then as an adult, we're like, why am I so rigid and uncomfortable in this situation? When you have been going on this journey of not only liberating yourself, but standing on stages mm -hmm. and guiding hundreds of people through deep practices, through sex magic, through, you know, very taboo in society's perspective topics you're going to become a projection for you. Like mm. people are going to project all over you like what it is bringing up within them. And so I would love to learn a little bit more about your journey around how you've alchemized those projections and how uh, you have been able to, and I'm sure it's a continued journey, not let these projections permeate the essence of who you are and keep you on the path of continuing to spread your voice in a good way? Mm, thank you. It's a really beautiful question. Um, so one thing that's really supported me is my grounding as a tantrika, mm -hmm. that like every, every aspect of consciousness is goddess consciousness. So I did get to start with this understanding that like, you know, part of spiritual development, if you're going to meditate in a cave, is to meet all aspects of reality, right? There's all these, like, Buddhist and tantric teachings of, like, sitting there and you get, like, the seductive goddesses, but you also get the terrifying demons and, like, finally you have to, like, kill the Buddha, like, all your illusions about reality. But you meet all these different aspects of reality as a way to find God consciousness in them. So I had the blessing of holding that. So when people are, like, horrific to me on the internet, I'm like, I could have sat in a cave and meditated for like 15 years to encounter this level of like toxicity. But like, you just came out of nowhere into my Instagram comments. So I get to like find, find the devotion, right? In it of just like, wow, this is an aspect of reality. Uh, I'll tell you about one really uh, very intense experience of that. But the other is that I spent about a year and a half in a, like you could call it a tantric jungle cult. Like if we're just going to be real honest, that's what it was. And I was working with like a Shaivite priestess, this Indian teacher, very powerful. Also in my experience, very distorted. Um, but one of the beautiful initiations that I got to go through was in that experience, which was a year and a half, sometimes very deep in the jungle, like all night ceremonies. We didn't take plant medicine. All we spoke was our truth, what was happening in your emotions, what was happening in your mind. And what was wild is speaking truth like that was more psychedelic than any psychedelic I've ever taken. Mm. So we would sit in a circle 
And we would just say, I'm feeling like a bubbling rage right now that we're getting started late. Like, I want to make out with you. I want to fucking kill you for just saying that about the person I have a crush on. Like, you would just, like, all of this. And so people said every imaginable thing to me. How ugly I was. How bad I smelled. How horrible my voice was. How, like, all, and people that ostensibly, like, I cared about, like I was living within this spiritual community. And so it really helped. I'm I'm so grateful for that experience because like once I then got out into the real world, I think one of the the most horrible instances I've ever had of, of that level of like hate and projection was right after Donald Trump got elected. So I think it was the day or two after he actually won. Um, and, uh, I was doing an interview on Fox news, like actual Fox news television. And so I was in the green room in New York city and it's just like plastered with Donald Trump heads or whatever. And I was like, Whoa, I was like, all right, let's just like, let's like center ourselves. Like the, like the mission is important. Your voice is important. Just like stay with it. And I got interviewed uh, about Yoni massage and different ways to heal Ta- like uh, on Fox News, yeah, on Fox News, this is amazing. Yeah, they did a whole Jade Egg thing. <laughs> it was great. So I was like, all right, fine. Like what? Like th- like this is this platform. I'm so happy that they're even doing this. And they said Yoni massage on Fox News, and I was like, okay, I don't want to die, but I could die now. And it was like, it was really cool. It was they posted a clip of that to their YouTube, to Fox News YouTube, and it was all about like real ways to heal sexual trauma. And so I talked about my experiences with my father. <gasps> that comment section I've never seen anything like it they were like you deserve to be abused you little slut like little girls only get abused if they want like the most like horrific I remember being like wow like we get to meet some of the like shadowiest forces of like human consciousness and like they've just forgotten you know, like they've forgotten their own beauty, their own heart, their own magnificence, their own innocence to such a level that this is the only way that they know how to meet mine. Think of the degree to which they must hate themselves, the pain they must be in right now. It's not that it doesn't make me uncomfortable. It certainly makes me the most sad that they would do that to other people who maybe can't integrate it or don't have the same awareness. And for sure, being a woman on the internet is no fucking joke and it's hard. So I don't want to take that away from anyone of how painful it can be and how challenging it can be. And, you know, it's like really understanding that's those people's gremlin, Mm -hmm. the same gremlin that I kind of wish they'd make out with that they've just alienated and they judge and shame so hard that the only thing it knows how to do is attack me now. Mm -hmm. It takes so much courage to go on a mainstream media, right? Like we've we've got like media, our podcasts, our YouTubes, and then you've got like mainstream media. And that is a whole different ballgame. Totally. There is so much distortion twisting of the stories projections there's a lot of a lot of um sadness and and grief and pain in the collective and the mainstream media is talking directly to that piece and ultimately keeping it alive and feeding it so to go on something like fox news which blows my mind and also i'm so happy about it <laughs> but, like and represent what it is that you're representing yeah. and then to expose yourself it feels like the you know the, the image of hanuman who's like opening his chest to like your deepest wound yeah. and also how you've alchemized it into na- the importance of your service but hanuman is literally ripping his chest open he, his heart is like doo, 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 doo. like he's just like holding it but like yeah you know out to the buzzards and it being picked at um, was there any aspect of that exposure specifically around such a vulnerable part of your journey that did bring you down or did question whether you want to continue to share on this path or in this way? Or was it more so just like over time just added fuel to the fire of how much it's needed on the planet? Mm, it's a really beautiful question. Um, I feel, I feel blessed that there has never been the questioning that this is my truth Mm. and there's nothing that would stop me from sharing my truth I think as well like I don't hold the sort of um like this precious attitude that just because I'm sharing from my heart or my truth or I'm doing something noble or something beautiful that that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be like attack that people are going to be having like the worst day ever on Instagram and like take it out on me. Mm -hmm. Like I just assume 
that that's part of it. And um, it definitely got to me a little bit just like threats and aggression and violence and stuff like that. Like that started to get to me for a little bit. And I also feel like I really resolved and integrated that within myself. And yeah, I feel like that same gremlin inside, right? When you turn inwards, you go, I loved someone recently sort of shared that like, that's the like yin journey or the feminine journey is like going inside to find the treasure, going all the way inside and facing all the dragons and Mm -hmm. the challenges and all of that. And then there's this external journey, which you could think of as young or masculine maybe where you're like facing all the external challenges. And so it's like, well, just like I would face any kind of challenge in a meditation retreat or a, a breath work or a, ser- a medicine ceremony, I know that the shadow is going to come up. I know it's going to be part of the process. And I also know as a great devotee of the goddess, it's part of her beauty mm. is the shadow. Part of her beauty is like the unpredictability, the mystery, right? I even saw like on a journey once that like we have the, the shadow and the light, right? Because because we split from oneness to be able to experience ourselves. But then the farther down the shadow and the light go, the wider they get from each other, the the farther the delta. And so you get like the stronger evil, like the, the unthinkable things, and then the highest light that could possibly be imagined. But then on the journey back to oneness, you get to know so much more of yourself. So whichever whichever part you're on, that journey back to oneness Every step of the way, you're knowing the iteration of yourself that originally separated, and you get this whole journey back of self knowledge, self gnosis. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, like how beautiful to get to know ourselves, to get to know all of reality. And so, for me, as a goddess devotee, finding God where it's the hardest to love, I will find God even there, Mm -hmm. even in the hate online, even in the most unthinkable things that the human psyche can do. And I feel like being willing to look at that and be with that and and include it in the wholeness of my reverence for all is part of what makes me a tantrika. Mm. I have so much appreciation for witnessing firsthand in the in-between moments of living together in the conversations that we've had in the kitchen and just like just in passing of certain things that have popped up triggers from external sources, things that have come up online. Or in person, there's been a confrontation. Remember, I remember you sharing with me about some gathering you were at, and there was a woman that was like, <sighs> and the levity and the lightheartedness, and the it's almost like a mm, on to the next <laughs> that I've been in such appreciation and admiration around it because on the journey of exposing and creating more media and and exposing my my heart my heart and my vulnerable truths like and then then the daggers that come in and like yeah. how much it can like oh mm-hmm. like it really hurts witnessing you so deeply established on your path not even just talking about taboo topics but talking about sexuality sensuality pleasure practice um sex magic i mean yeah. the, the the full range of expressions and to be able to go <laughs> I'm like, oh, thank God someone is setting a reference point for how this can look and feel that this doesn't need to be the worst thing ever. And like, it doesn't, it, it feels almost like there's a body of water and like one nasty comment or like one that really pierces is like a, it's like one drop of ink and a giant body of water. However, that one drop of ink then clouds all the rest of the water and all of a sudden the water's completely purple. And it's like my whole day of a what? Some random person that's just having a tough one, you know? <laughs> and so I have so much appreciation um, for the way that you're weaving it with such grace. So, well, you've taught me so much about the heart. Every single day you have, I will, all, I, like, I think I can say the most magnificent heart anyone I've ever met in how inclusive and all encompassing it is. And it's always been an invitation for my heart to like expand that much deeper. Like you're a lighthouse of heart. It's, it's amazing. And just like, I've been such a permission pillar for you around arrows and sexuality and a kind of like spiritual courage of some sort. (laughs) Like like to be able to play, play in this reality. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. that's what she wants from us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you've been this like deepest inspiration of, Everywhere I've been like, I don't love that much. So like, what, where do I have to go inside myself to find that love? Mm. Hey, there was a time I didn't take care of you when you were sick. There's a way in which I feel you hold the, the house in such a way that you're always looking out for everyone's well-being, everyone's thriving. And like, 
I care about those things, but you see it in the actions. And so I am so grateful that you are a being of such pristine love that you actually show me where my heart is still has gremlins in it. And then I get to go and love those gremlins so we can unlock those portals of heart and love even better. Thank you for saying that. I really, really do receive it. And this is it. This is the epitome of sisterhood. This is like, <clears throat> it's almost like, um, I, I kind of like, I had an idea, but we, we have a gremlin party. But we actually yeah! like dress up as our shadow essence and we all dance together. And then and I'm like, a gremlin orgy. In the center, and just go like, yeah, I got this. And I got that. And we dance around it on a full moon with our titties out. Like I'm here for that. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and what I love too about your integrity and your pristineness, and I can say this, is like, it's what's so special about you is you have so much integrity and pristineness without being boring. You know, because sometimes it can be like just like like it's like an uptight pristineness, and you're like, that's cool, I love that person, but like we're not gonna have that much fun together. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, bless you, and like we need a touch of gremlin to keep things yeah. interesting. <laughs> but I've seen in the most private moments of of your heartbreak and your challenge and your difficulty when you're sick or when you're feeling broken or when you're the most challenged and life is giving it to you, you still choose love, like in private. You are full of love and integrity, and that's so beautiful. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Heart pocket. Just keep that. Well, we've got it recorded, so I can just watch this podcast back and just like <laughs> receive the, the the gift of that blessing and your reflection. Thank you so much. Um, something that we we got into, like I don't know, three days after me moving into the house. Yeah, it was good. Can we go there? <laughs> yeah, let's oh. go. That's what I was just thinking. I was yeah. like, <laughs> Come on, segue, <laughs> darling. Um, is a so this would be like a perfect segue into. I I don't know. I don't even think it was a week at this point. I hadn't even been in the house a week. Yeah. And at the first house meeting, I think it was like a new moon ceremony that we all did before like I officially moved in with with Nadia also moving in at the same time. And you were all giggling. Like it was almost like you knew something that I didn't know that I was going to get enrolled into. And I was kind of like nervous and excited and curious and also yeah. a little like timid. And you're all like, ah, we're going to initiate her. There's like 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 this fresh chicken that's just kind of just sprung into the house you know that's like bright eyed bushy tail don't know what she got herself into um, I could feel it brewing but I didn't really know what it was that y'all was sitting on and then within a week less than you're like okay like let's all do sex magic together and I was like the what? <laughs> like, uh, what, what, uh, what, uh, and I could feel my heart pounding and my face is going red and I was a little sweaty and I was like oh yeah, you girls are like probably a little like restricted in this area, you know? It's like what I have been told and also just in boarding school, if we were 30 centimeters closer to somebody than the opposite sex, like literally it would bring a ruler out and like measure. Totally. We would get like a slap on the wrist or we'd have to like write lines or certain things that were not accessible. You can't like, you can't hold hands with someone of the opposite sex. Like This is programmed in my consciousness from a very young age. And so it it's it recognizing that my eros, sensuality, sexuality, and full liberation of my birthright self was limited to basically drinking it through a straw. Mm. It's like putting a straw in the ocean mm. and being like, this is how much I can receive. Mm. And so in these conversations and being in your parameter, I've realized, because subconsciously I've been drinking through a straw my whole life. I didn't even know I was drinking through a straw. Mm. So being in the presence of, of all of you fabulous women, there's five of us that live here. It's incredible. Um, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm drinking through a straw my whole life and I'm actually not allowing myself to receive and bathe in the ocean. Yeah. And so <clears throat> within a week, we we had Mama Gina, who is the author of the notorious book Pussy, which was one of the books that completely transformed my life with my relationship to my own pussy and my own personal power. And then I couldn't believe that within a week, this author that I thought was like so incredible happens to be one of your best friends, of course. And then she came over to stay with us and it was like, okay, we're going to do a sex magic ritual. Yes. <laughs> and um, so I would love for you to share a yeah. little bit more about what sex magic is. Perfect time for you to take your jacket off. <laughs> <laughs> a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> We're here, sweetheart. Let's go. Sex magic. Tell me about it. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. Um, so for those that are like sex what? Uh, they don't understand or like it's a completely new concept or term yeah. um, like it was for me when it was first introduced. Yeah. What is sex magic? All right. So sex magic is a practice where you build your pleasure and your turn on through, you can do it with a partner. We did it with solo practice. So you can do it solo or partnered. Um, I'll explain it solo first because it's a little easier to understand. So I'm turning myself on. I'm building my sexual energy. And so sexual energy is a type of fuel for whatever you're doing. And so you spend time as you're turning yourself on spiraling it through each of the chakra bands. So not through an individual chakra, but through the whole area of the body that that chakra correlates to. And you're activating that part of your body with pleasure and turn on. So you make your way all the way up. So you've activated your whole body, your whole nervous system with arrows and turn on. It also counteracts the way so many of us have been programmed to have sex, which is we're actually uncomfortable to feel that much pleasure and that much energy surging through our bodies. So the same way that we're chronically conditioned to reject pleasure and goodness uh, socially, we do it in our bodies. So we actually tense up, we push out. A climax is kind of like a uh, uh, instead of a uh, uh. Like, mm -hmm. and so you can actually feel the difference of how pleasure and energy flow through your body. So you're repatterning how much ecstasy, how much pleasure, how much energy can flow through your body. You develop a, uh, a singular manifestation. So you make it really clear the way that I do it is with what I call five senses reality, where you see yourself having it. What are you wearing? What do you taste? What do you touch? What do you hear? Like, what are the sounds around you? What do you feel? Um, so you're basically bringing the five senses online. You're putting yourself into the full 3D spectrum reality of having what you desire, one singular desire. When you get the energy all the way up to your crown, you can put yourself into a peak state of pleasure or have an orgasm. And at the moment of peak pleasure or orgasm, as the energy comes out of your crown into the universe, you put yourself into that five senses reality. Mm -hmm. So you're sealing your manifestation. And the reason that this is so powerful is that there's usually three things that you need to make a manifestation powerful. The first is to get out of just your prefrontal cortex, like only your thinking mind. So that's when we do affirmations. We're engaging the most superficial, least effective part of our nervous system. And we all know that you can be like, I want this, I want this, I want this. And your deeper nervous system, your body's like, hell no. So most of your programming that's resistant to going bigger, having more, doing the scary things, right? Being Having more incredible sex, having the spiritual awakening, making more money, that's actually programmed in your body. And so through sex magic, you're bringing your body online so that when you make the manifestation, your whole body is listening. Mm -hmm. So you also want to combine it with a heightened energetic state because the more activated you are, the more accessible your being is to quantum reality, to being able to create from a higher energy expression, right? It makes sense. Like if you're, if you're like tired and run down and you're like, I'm going to manifest, it doesn't have the same vibrational quality mm -hmm. and uh, successful possibility as being like, yeah, like let's do it. Right. So energy is really important. So when you do sex magic, you're activating your entire body with energy. And finally, you want to let your entire nervous system know, so your conscious and subconscious mind, that what you desire is pleasurable. So most of the time when we want something but we're not able to get it, it's because we're programmed to believe that it's actually scary, that it's actually dangerous or that it won't feel good, right? So you're like, I want to make more money, but I'm scared of being that powerful. I want to have way better sex, but I'm terrified of surrender. I want to be in an incredible partnership but I'm so scared of getting hurt by love, right? Mm -hmm. So our body's fear of our desired reality is usually the limiting factor in us being able to seek that reality out in the world. And so when you do sex magic, you're actually imprinting your highest desire with not just pleasure, but like some of the deepest pleasure you can have. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it reprograms your body to know because your system doesn't know the difference between a visualization and reality, that that reality is not only safe, but deeply pleasurable. Mm -hmm. So you're combining these three very potent pieces with manifestation that's so incredibly powerful. Also, one of the things that I found is that, you know, in, in like the deeper, in the deeper path, getting out of this idea that I need to have reality match my mental image in order to be happy but instead practicing a very, very deep surrender with reality while being an embodied co-creator. Mm -hmm. So part of sex magic as well is practicing this deep gratitude for like where you are, loving what you have, 
and actually then manifesting with an open palm. And so that's part of the deeper feminine practice as well, is making yourself magnetic to what you desire, but also deeply embracing what is at the same time. And this unlocks a whole new level of manifestation capacity. Doing it, you can do it by yourself, which is very powerful, but it's more powerful in a group. And what's amazing for me about my journey with sex magic is I learned to do it, you know, probably like 15-ish years ago, maybe even 20. And I was a little skeptical because I came from like the like the tantric school of like, you know, I've always been a bit of a lefty. So I've always wanted to enjoy this life while I awaken. Mm -hmm. And I was like anything that was like too manifesty, too witchy, all of that. I was like, like, no, that can't be it. And my friends started asking, like, can we do sex magic? Can we do sex magic? Can we do sex magic? And I was like, well, surely, like, why not? So then I like find myself standing out in nature with a circle of naked women self-pleasuring their way into understanding themselves as co-creators and powerful manifestors of reality. And I was like, holy shit, this is witchcraft. Like, <laughs> this is what they killed the witches for, is knowing how to use the forces of nature and sexuality to be powerful co-creators with the entire universe. Because once you know that and you have access to your arrows, right, it's not that you're unstoppable, but you're certainly not a sheep anymore. Like, you're out of the hypnotic uh, addiction of unworthiness that permeates humanity, the mm -hmm. self-loathing, the self-hatred, right? Mm -hmm. Like, again, it's like, you know, if you, if you want to stop the witches, like teach them to hate themselves and self-loathe and repress their sexuality, right? So this reclamation mm -hmm. of that arrows and of the sexual power and of the audacity to remember the things that we were killed for felt so potent. And what's wild is we tend to think of it as being so scary, right? Because we're all programmed that way. But it's not an accident because that's the way they used to worship the goddess in the Middle East, um, in ancient Egypt, and in Europe, in the goddess temples. They were filled with arrows. They were filled with emotion, dance, celebration, feasting, sexual practices. That's how you knew the divine, it's one of the ways that you worshiped. And because the goddess religions were at war with the, the Judeo-Christian religions, once Christianity started to spread, it made everything that was an access path to goddess worship, demonic, evil, um, punishable on threat of death, including these like very arrows infused rituals, right? And when I do it with people in my programs, we've done like 100 with Mama G and I did 900, right? Uh, we did it together, 900, 900 women. People. 900 yeah. women doing sex pleasuring magic. themselves at the same time. Yes. And you were leading. It. Yeah, at a Broadway theater. Me and Regina were on stage together. It was her last mastery. It was one of her final crowning moments. And so much sisterhood. She invited me to share this like moment of triumph as she concluded a program that was like her life's work. And we held hands on stage and we self-pleasured and we led these 900 women through sex magic. And what everyone says, and I know this was part of your experience too, was like, some like before I did it, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And as I'm in it, I'm like, this is the most natural thing ever. Like, what have I been doing? Like, besides self pleasuring with my best girlfriends, remembering my own power and magnificence, and channeling my arrows. And everyone's like, oh, but isn't masturbating like not good for your partnership? It's like, no, you're such a better lover and partner when you're able to connect to your mm -hmm. arrows in that way. It's so incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. So. I still remember after we did that, we like just set the the ritual space on the living room floor. And yes, Regina was there. And it was so beautiful. I remember afterwards you were like, not only was that so natural, but just look at everything I did before I was connected to my arrows. Mm -hmm. Just imagine what's possible for me now. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was so beautiful. Mm. It, okay. Wow. Well, I'm still kind of like, mind blown that you just led 900 women in this <laughs> practice like that was a fact i did not know also not surprised and the visual i'm getting right now is like whoa the ripple in the fabric of the collective consciousness that was created when everyone orgasmed and climaxed at the same time all 900 women holding in their vision of the highest most unapologetic fully activated primal selves and anchoring that frequency in through all collectively sending that attention, intention, and the, the eros of the climax of their body all at once while you're leading the way. I'm like, wow, this exists, okay? Like, y'all live at home that did not know this exists. Now you do. Now your expanded awareness has happened in real time. Uh, and then about my personal experience, yeah, leading up to it, I was super nervous. I was like 
she, I don't want anyone looking at me. You know, I was like, this is this. There's some belief that this is like this is this is mine and must be always covered. And and that there's like, I felt like there was a false sense of power in that. Mm. Like if you see any aspect of myself in that way outside of like my romantic partnership, then then I give away a bit of my power mm. um, and that it's not safe. And so it's so easy to get caught up in the in the maze of the mind yeah. of believing these things to be actually true. And therefore, then the body responding, right? Our, our cells and our body really have two jobs to listen and respond. And if the internal conversation has been hijacked away from truth and into a place of shame, then the body responds that that's the truth. And anything that is not in that truth or parameter, then all of a sudden it's not safe and the defense mechanism come up. And so... For me, like the way that my consciousness is constructed is that when I feel contriction, when I feel nervousness, when I feel crunch, when I feel judgment, that's exactly the direction I want to go in because it's also holding my power captive. And so that was what I reflected at the end that you just shared was I realized how powerful I have been up until this point and I haven't even tapped or dabbled into this realm and so just imagining what is more capable when I can allow myself to open up to these realms and transmute the shame and the guilt um, for just being who I am which is a, you know a sexual sensual being specifically with five planets in Scorpio you know like this is very <laughs> deep inside of me and needed that permission to be expressed and so we sat in a circle we had our own individual stations it was all women it was so beautiful because it was open in the sense of you gave specific cues of what is our desires to, to to receive from this experience and what are our fears. Like, let's just lay them on the table. And so it was so beautiful to witness each sister share what it was that was actually coming up for them in how similar there was a common theme, which created yeah. a deep sense of relatability across the board. And then there was two pillars specifically, you and Mama Gina, um, uh, who have really, I mean, this has become your life's work, but, but there is just no shame. Like yeah. there's just no holding back. There's full freedom. There's full vulnerability. And so being able to create a reference point in the space of, oh, okay, that's what's possible. She's also setting the bar yeah. so that we can reach her and join into that space as opposed to our frequency of shame to be the thing that becomes the dominating frequency in the space, but actually setting the, sh the place of liberation as the dominating frequency so that the rest of us can actually meet you in that way. And then there was, <laughs> there's also, you know, there was a moment where I just kind of like, I can't believe that this is happening right now, but there was like a jar of dildos that were just like handed out and they were like soaking in warm water and it was just like pot. It was like a pot of dildos. Like I was like, oh, take your dildo. I was like, wow. Well, I have Not a story about that pot of dildos that I don't think you or anyone else really knows, which is like, like it must have been somewhat recently after that, because afterwards we put the dildos back in the pot and we were going to boil them. Right. And it was just sort of like, OK, like, we'll we'll cleanse them and boil them or whatever, because people were like borrowing. Um, so we had like <laughs> we, had, we had brand new ones and then we boiled them and what and whatever. I don't know what was going on, but we ended up having like a pot of dildos on the stove. And I had been set up with this very high profile husband, like potential husband. Like, you're going to meet him. It's a really big deal. Like, all of this. So I, like, literally met him. It would have been, like, a like within the week or whatever. And and there was this instant connection and instant chemistry. And it was really sexy. It was really hot. And he was, like, carrying my stuff for me. And we were, like, walking to this, like, stage. And uh, and he asked me about the queendom. And I can't remember exactly how it came up. But I was, like, yeah, I have a pot of five dildos sitting on my stove. <laughs> 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 and he goes, you might be too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> really? But, you know. You might be too much. I mean, you're fine. You know, you know, like and, to that. I mean, look, we, we, had a, we had a real vibe. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, it's probably better that you know what I am. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, got to lay it all out on the table, let's, baby. Let's find it that's, out now. That's actually just sort of like stage one, really. I mean, from everybody else's perspective, I'm sure there's people that are watching this, maybe even my parents. Sorry, mom and dad, but I have to go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is 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 uh, that this um you know like from most people's perspective this is level 10 we're at level 10 there's a pot of dildos being handed out we're at level 10 we meet and you know, at a deep edge you're like oh this is child's play like this is mild which i so deep appreciate because it's like 
you think that you dove to the depth and then when it's like, oh, well, there's actually been an expose of like an even deeper level in layer that can be exposed. And it just shows that the vastness of the rabbit hole just doesn't end. And no. that's the mystery and the great mystery of constantly being alive and just peeling back the layers of it. However, specifically regarding this topic, what I realized so deeply was that, um, was that it never as bad as the stories in my head. Yeah. And afterwards, I remember feeling the reconnection to the innocence of my eros, that it's inherently innocent. Yeah. It's just like if I was to go paint a painting, my eros comes from the same chakra. It is as innocent as painting a painting, but all of the stories, all of the distortion has told me otherwise, mm -hmm. which has created a world based off of my internal narrative. And so, uh, this has been the theme throughout our exploration together mm. is finding the edge, trusting you implicitly, sharing that edge with me and you bringing your expertise and meeting me within that space and transmuting deep emotions. And I've realized that when I've gone into these spaces with you more times than not, I've actually like cried mm. and there has been, and I was not expecting these emotions to come up because mm. So a decade of my life has been devoted to peeling back the layers of the limitation. And in these spaces, I didn't realize how captive I was being held and mm. how deep this goes. Mm. And in those tears, you've held me, like physically held me mm. and just affirm that it's safe mm. and what you've done in that is like over patience and time and the gift of being able to live together is that you have helped reprogram my nervous system like what you said at the beginning um and this is why i believe that your work is is just so important mm. so needed now i'd love to just pivot into the direction of when we have gone on this internal journey, this journey of our own individual reclamation, of our birthright, how does this, when this is integrated in a way that feels really true, contribute to sacred union? Mm. How does this connect with another being that is also gone on their internal journey, gone on their own reclamation, transmuted the shame and guilt as much as they possibly can. Of course, there's always more to be done and got to a place of like sovereignty within one's own sexual energy. And these two individuals meet. What are the alchemical potency that lies here? I mean, that level, like that's what I'm currently exploring. And it feels so revolutionary and so incredible. Because if the vast majority of humans that have been meeting in sacred union are doing so with the core part of their power and their arrows blocked, right? And those of us who are very spiritual and want a spiritual life, a personal development life, have been told, like, you can have spirituality in God, but only if you do it this way. Mm -hmm. Like, only if you don't bring it into your sexuality, even uh, only if you don't claim Aros all the way. That's been a huge limiting factor in how intimate we can be and how sexual we can be and how activated and alive we can be with each other. So the thing that I've kept feeling is, like, even in having... I believe every woman is and every feminine being is really a high priestess sex witch deep down inside. Like that is the essential nature of, of every woman. And I believe that in, you know, male female dynamics that men are starved for that. They're simultaneously terrified of it because of all of the cultural conditioning. And because now it's like they've needed it for so long, but it hasn't been available. And at the same time, so I believe every woman and feminine being is a high priestess sex witch. And so we don't even know what intimacy and full sex and full sacred union can be like. I feel like in our community, we're just really starting to see it happen. And that in some ways, this like highest sacred union that I look up to um, is happening with women who have claimed their sexual power, claimed their arrows, claimed their, their erotic freedom and then brought that into a sacred union container. So you can still be 
monogamous, right? You can still be devoted to one person or you can be polyamorous. It doesn't matter, but you don't limit your eros to just being sex with your partner, Mm. right? You can be monogamous and have erotic experiences in nature by yourself, right? You can be very monogamous and be in a sex magic circle with your girlfriends and no one's touching each other, right? There is still so much possibility for partnership devotion, even in that. And yet the full sexual expression of a couple, I don't even think we've found out yet fully. Mm-hmm. And as I start to taste it because of all of the work that I've done and 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 meeting it in, in a man who, who can meet me there, I'm like, what? And, you know, in my eight and a half year partnership with Andrew, we had a deep tantric practice. It was incredible. It was mind blowing. It was powerful. And there's a whole nother level of reclamation and meeting that becomes available to us when we have this arrows activated and the level of union and the level of intimacy and the depth of the sex. It's, it's amazing. And what's blocking most people, honestly, in my experience is most people are terrified of intimacy and terrified of that level of love. So we maybe even get into long-term relationships, but we don't go all the way because we don't even go all the way with ourselves. So once you learn to go all the way with yourself, sexually in your own heart and then you start to understand that you can become more spiritual more in love with the goddess more conscious through your sexual expression through your relational dynamics then this whole other level of relationship becomes possible and i think what's really cool about the zeitgeist is all of us including all of you listening like we get to map that together we get to explore that together Mm -hmm. I feel a completely new way of relating to intimacy is really being born on the planet and it is moving beyond ownership, right? Like if we have a beautiful flower, it's like, I love this flower. It's so beautiful. I'm going to pick it and scold it. You know, it kills the flower. It dies. But actually in the, the witnessing of the flower and just honoring the flower and making sure that the flower has the right you know, the right amount of water, the right amount of sunlight, actually that flower continues to flourish, but without grabbing it. And so there's a new way of relating that I'm seeing being birthed on the planet. And just in my immediate reality within my own internal experience as well is that there's less possession, more freedom, and in the freedom, the choice actually to then come together. And I think that in that freedom and that choice, partner with the sovereignty and also even knowing that it's possible to reach altered states of consciousness through divine union through sex magic between the two beings yeah um there is a book called the magdalene manuscript which is a journey of uh mary magdalene and um uh yeshua and the the alchemy and the sex alchemy that was created between the two of them to create an altered state of consciousness and uh, open awareness we're starting to play in realms of magic that we have always had available just by being alive and yet just not known how to use the vehicle. Yes. Yeah. Um, how, how do you choose uh, within that space of, um, of sacred union? How do you navigate the balance and the dance between full freedom and claiming? I think it is a unique initiation for all of us. I think it can be a unique feminine initiation that when you're really on the spiritual path, you start to learn like nothing is forever. Everything is always changing. And so even if you spend your whole life with one devoted partner, you never know for sure that that's how it's going to end up. So every day is an offering. Every relationship is an offering every moment, every day. And I think that can be so hard. I know for me personally, like there's a part of my feminine heart that wants to be like, like say it's forever and like we'll get married and this will never change and things will always be the same and we'll always love each other this way and it's always going to be fabulous. And there's the priestess in me, the oracle in me, the consciousness in me knows that you can never guarantee anything like that. You know, I can't guarantee anything's going to last. I can't guarantee any friendship, any pet, any business endeavor we'll see tomorrow. I I don't even know that I'll be alive tomorrow. So getting too addicted to the story of permanence is going to create a kind of imbalance or even mental toxicity over time for those of us who are deep spiritual practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I think the highest expression of the heart, and I'm still working on this in my own practice, 
is to offer as a, as a tantrika, I use funeral pyre, right? Like I'm going to offer it to the funeral pyre. I'm going to offer my business every day. I'm going to offer my health every day. I'm going to offer the queendom every day. I'm going to offer my love every day and my beloved because I never know if I'll get them back. I'll never, like, only what is true will stay with me every day. And to live that with an open heart mm. and to trust that journey and that if it's true for us to die in each other's arms, then we will. And if it's not, I can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. My mind can't make something happen that is not true in the universe. And so for me, that's what starts to make that level of love the ultimate surrender is how deeply can I give of myself? And the thing is, is in traditional culture, right, you rested on the safety of till death do us part. Your safety came from we don't get divorced. And everything's cost benefit, right? There's a beauty to that kind of stability. There's a, there's a beauty to like, hey, parents picked us based on like our natal charts when we were 18 and we're married and we're just going to do the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a kind of surrender to that. There's a joy to that that can be found. And then there's a whole host of toxicity, right? The person's abusive or has a drug problem or you don't really love them or you love someone, else, right? There's all this like lack of choice then as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a beauty in every cultural decision and every life path to me. The thing I think that we're getting to and that I'm really exploring is where does that safety come from then if you can't rest in the safety of until death do us part and in a culture with divorce, we know deep in our hearts that we never can, not with anyone. So what we can rest in is the safety of trust and God. And so I feel like what's interesting is that next level of sacred union, the safety comes from trust and God. And that's where you get the power to open your heart and your sexuality that deeply, knowing that every day with any person is a gift. And if that carries you to the rest of your life, like beautiful. And if it doesn't, that's something you can't control. And that's the trust and the surrender part. Mm -hmm. When you say that, you know, I think back on my past relationships and in those moments, I think, oh, I, I, I connected to a narrative that says this person is the one. And so the one means forever. Yeah. So that that means I can dilute the days because I'll have this forever. Yeah. And when I actually look back on it, you know, there's a time frame of the contract that was agreed and written of that, which will be mutual beneficial until it's not. And the contract will close. And the when the way that you're speaking about this in so much it, it is, it's like um, what I've, I've learned very little about the, the path of Tantra is like to hold it. Um, like if you're holding anything, for example, I'm holding my phone right now. It's like holding it. I'm holding it, but I'm not. Oh, grasping it it's with an open palm yeah and in that then it can be subject to allow the freedom to be born within that space however it's not constricting life and when you share that I reflect back on past relationships and think you know if I had actually shifted my narrative around what this really was mm. I would have appreciated every day a little bit more and that's the thing like I feel like in our minds we start thinking like oh well if I don't know it's forever then what's it all for? What does it all mean? But we've also been very conditioned, especially as women, to believe that the value of a relationship is forever because previously we couldn't make our own money. We couldn't live our own lives. We weren't free to do as we wished. So our, our whole psychological well-being and financial well-being was attached to a man. So like, God help you, that man better never leave you, mm -hmm. right? And so we're changing the narrative now instead of like, what do I have to do to survive in this society? to what's true and can I live the truth of every moment that is tantra mm -hmm. like can I can I have the courage to live the truth of every moment and here's the thing the truth of the moment could be monogamy the truth of the moment can be deep commitment right mm -hmm. and for me like I believe in early stage relationships for me like monogamy is the right choice and I don't believe that if I'm with someone for 100 years that monogamy is the right choice for 100 years for me mm -hmm. right like there's a shifting truth in it and what I do is choose what's true in the moment and know that like, that's all I can ever do. But this is also like a, it's a stage of practice, right? Because you have to trust that the other person is choosing into what's true as well, that they're not going to abuse that or manipulate or take it for granted or whatever, that you're both showing up in the truth of the moment, giving all you can, loving with your whole hearts every day that you're together mm -hmm. and that. Truly, if it lasts forever, that's going to lead to the most beautiful outcome. And if it doesn't, exactly as you're saying, you know, what I wouldn't give for another day with Andrew back in our relationship, just whole 
hearted, no worrying about whether we're partners forever, no being like part in or out attached to the dream of what I want us to be, but just with the beauty of that man, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we're loving just because we want a certain outcome, like it's not really love. Mm -hmm. Truly. And I've learned that as as the, the container may change. However, the love remains. And yeah. that is a testament of true love. And I think both you and I have, uh, you just recorded a podcast on your new podcast um, with Andrew, your lover yeah. and your beloved of eight, eight years. And um, I did a podcast with Andre and, and had that conversation and just really, truly from our own personal lens and experience of navigating such deep love and to change the transition of the container and to be able to see Andrew in the house and you guys co-creating and him coming to gatherings and it being incorporated that, that there is a way of doing this where recognizing that if it's not love, then it won't last forever. But if it's truly love, it will last forever, no matter what container and shape that it ch- changes and takes. And so there's, yeah, there's so much, um, rewriting of the narrative to the story of what truly allows us to create our own map of consciousness as opposed to what is expected from us and from that place allow ourselves to live a much more liberated experience and that's ultimately the 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 work that you're doing Mm -hmm. on all levels and i feel like we've covered such a beautiful wide brush stroke of a range of experiences while also at the same time just tapping the surface of of what it is that you've been cultivating and how you weave the world and your lens and your personal perspectives and um and so i feel like this is a beautiful start point to introduce you to the deja vu podcast uh audience and at the same time i would love 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 to have you back and just continue to peel back the layers and i don't know if you're interested but uh you know maybe we should live together yeah <laughs> you know it's kind of a forward invitation for having just done a podcast together. <gasps> but considering we're both the kind of women who had basically like an hour of knowing each other and then decided to move in together, it's yeah. actually not that surprising. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. We do. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> our, your next, uh, our next podcast should be how to have an orgy with your defensive, psychologically conditioned gremlin tribe. <laughs> yeah. A great clickbait right <laughs> yeah yeah put that one in the show notes please oh, yeah <laughs> yeah i think it's a great title <clears throat> i think people will be like wow i feel so weirdly seen <laughs> five dildos on the stove part two <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly exactly let's leave them wanting more you know? <laughs> i still look at that i was like this is a man like anyone would have tried to impress in the whole world i was like it's true that i have five dildos on the stove so like i gotta be real about that yeah 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 <laughs> maybe maybe you're a bit too much for me okay good i'm glad we cleared this one up you know now we know how to move forward great you're not the human for me because this is mild <laughs> i remember going to the kitchen that morning and going to make a cup of tea or something and just looking over on the stove and be like yeah. <laughs> and be like oh wow who have i become this is now my new normal brilliant i'm here for it and we're going to talk about that too like in in an, I, you're going to come on my podcast and talking about like finding love and dating as being an oracle and being a high priestess because then when i started dating someone who was like Leila, like you should never date anyone who would even mildly entertain the thought that you wouldn't have five dildos on the stove at all time like right. what are you even thinking yeah and i was like it's a new default yeah, <laughs> create your own defaults. But if you have any constriction around there being five dildos on my stove right now at home, yeah, then this isn't gonna work. No. So let's just lay that one right out there on the first date. Let's get super clear. No shame if that's where you're at, but this isn't a party that I want to dance at. Okay. <laughs> Great. Glad we got that cleared up. It's like one of my red flags now is I've never done psilocybin. I'm like, this isn't going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> it's almost like, a, like, it reminds me of my driving test in America yeah. when I was like in the car and I pulled out and my wheel touched the curb. And within 30 seconds, the guy turned to me and goes, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? We've been only at this for 30 seconds. He's like, you hit the curb, get out. <laughs> And I was like, I mean, that kind of reminds me of like, you know, we're in the car, we're about to go on a journey. Oh, before you take off, just so you know, five deal dice on the stove. No. Okay, get out. (laughs) We're done. (laughs) You're like, if that alarms you, just wait till Tuesday. (laughs) Taco Tuesday, you know what I mean? (laughs) 
plate for Blue. <laughs> I'm sweating. <sighs> Oh, by the way, if you're listening to this episode and not watching it, and we've just been laughing basically for the last five minutes straight, go to the YouTube and watch the video. You'll be able to be able to feel the fullness of the experience a little bit more. <laughs> That's your invitation right now. Unless you're driving. If you're taking a driving test yeah, yeah, yeah. or your dates in the car trying to establish whether they've ever taken mushrooms or not, don't watch the YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the discernment. Or operating heavy machinery. Don't operate heavy machinery. <laughs> Trying to get pregnant? No, maybe. Maybe you should listen to this while trying to get pregnant. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah. know. I think that's probably a good idea. <laughs> anyway, that's probably a great place to end it. <laughs> uh, Layla, for all of those beings that are like, okay, got to follow this woman's journey. Oh my gosh. You're not already following you on social media or all of the things. Where do we find you? Where do we continue to go on this journey with you? How can we support you? I'm just give it a set. Lay it down, lady. <laughs> Honestly, it sounds super old school, but the way that I share the best, most incredible content, like pour my heart out, is on my email list. And it's really special. We were like, we should come up for a word besides email list, but like, yo, it's an email list and it's so good. Uh. So you can head to my website, which is laylamartin.com, and just find any place on there. You can either get one of the opt ins or you can sign up with your email address anywhere on the website and you will get my weekly emails, which I share kind of these adventures and this depth and this revelation, this living tantra. Um, YouTube is where I have a whole library of teaching videos. If you want to get started on the breath work or the pleasure practices, things like that, that I've mm -hmm. shared, follow me on Instagram. But honestly, my website is really where we have the vast majority of the library of content. So checking that out and it's laylamartin.com. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And I just also want to place again, the emphasis on, we've talked about the power of manifestation through orgasm. And I believe personally that rocket fuel for manifestation is also the frequency of play. Mm. And as you can tell from our conversation in this podcast, our relationship, uh, the depth in which we go, the concepts that we unpack together, the sensuality, the sexuality, the sex magic, the, 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 the re reclamation of that potent chi energy, mm. and simultaneously the potency of the play. And mm. when we partner our full sensual, uh, partnership with our full liberated sensuality and our ability to tap into the genius of the child which is bringing that levity and the lightheartedness and the silly giggles with it we partner those two together then this really is a very potent combination yeah. to allow us to evolve to the next evolution of consciousness to see things clearer without the distortion so and also to be able to manifest and to place that sh that fuel right into the rocket ship of what it is that we want to create and so it is truly such an honor to have gone on our own individual journeys but to meet together in this home mm -hmm. and to bring those two big pieces of unlocking the play in the heart and unlocking the sensuality mm -hmm. and the sexuality and then to live in this beautiful home and to be able to create a set that we can create media as medicine that we can collaborate together that we can go dress up in the in the dress up closet like we have a closet in the house that's just full of costumes and we play dress up and too full but it's great <laughs> There's so many costumes that we're actually having a hard time accessing them. <laughs> That's what the people want to see on Instagram. They want to see us cleaning the garage together yeah, yeah. <laughs> and organizing the costume closet because it's a, it's a real thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> Eventually, it's like, we'll get it's like it. one of the fundamental lies of humanity is that spirituality has to be serious. Yeah, yeah. But cleaning the garage is serious. <laughs> Actually, hold on. We were best in music. We're having a good time. I found a bunch of snacks in there, which I ate while eating the, 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 the cleaning the closet. And and we have we have created a new narrative. Shout out to Nadia that we are building the garage mahal. That's true. It is a fancy gym garage. Yeah. Also, I'm going to interrupt this moment to also say because most people don't know this about me. Like one of the main things I do. So I have online mm -hmm. trainings and like an online initiation into sacred sexuality. So if you just want to learn that, one of the main things I do is actually a professional certification. So we mm -hmm. have a year long professional certification. Mm -hmm. So you can be a coach in having a tantric approach to sex, love, and relationships, mm -hmm. and that is beta coaching. So mm -hmm. I wanted to share that in case anyone out there is interested in that. Amazing. It's called Vita. Vita coaching. Vita. Yeah. Vita coaching. Yes. 
Uh, incredible. Well, now we have, there's a lot for people to chew on. There's a lot to marinate and integrate and also leaving everyone wanting a little bit more, which is always the way with Layla Martin. Um, <laughs> and so thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the Deja Vu podcast. Such a gift to be able to have this conversation with you and to have all of these giggles and to collaborate with you in all of the dimensions and all of the ways. You're such a blessing in my life. Uh, I love you. I love you too. Uh, <laughs> All righty, beautiful humans. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Deja Blue podcast. May this podcast be the invitation for you to dive deep into uncovering the trapdoor and where your gremlin resides and to look at that gremlin dead in the eye. Maybe ruffle this little comb over hair on the top of his head with a few hairs only left and to maybe even go there and make out with it and to allow yourself to liberate your power back from those that, that those places that you deem unworthy or shameful or disgusting and allow yourself to create a new narrative from the inside out so that you can live a much more liberated life which is ultimately your birthright so if you resonate with today's episode then please go ahead and share it on your instagram stories tag myself Layla martin the deja vu podcast um and so that we can reach many 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 more people than we can with our own individual platforms and if you believe that this is a could support a friend in their liberation in creating a new narrative around how they weave in this world then please also go directly send it to those that you care and love and until next week I hope you'll be going deep into your pleasure practice and blasting off your orgasms to what it is that you want to call into your life because why the fuck not? <laughs> May your pot of stone dildos always be full. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, see you next week. Bless. <laughs> <laughs>